today we get to talk to you. My name is Nathan. My, this is my wife, Sharon. We're pastors at the Victory Outreach, one church, three locations, and specializing in just going to the darkest places that we can um, with the brightest light we have is Jesus, is love. And our, our team is, we got Jesse and Jake and Kyle. We got an awesome team. Our site pastors are just over here. Um, Vic, yeah, they're, they're the guys that, you know, they, they probably have better answers than us. Um, but we've been tasked with the topic of how to reach or how to handle or how to deal with or how to help those caught in abuse and addiction in 25 minutes. Two big topics. That is just abusive, you know. Uh, is, uh, so they we're the one that needs the help. But as we get started, guys, I want to start here. First, let's pray. Um, and then I want to have a landing spot, the thing that I want us to ca- catch, because there's some teaching that's going to happen, but there's things that you need to catch. Um, so, Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for this room. We thank you for a beautifully long, full day of teaching. And, Father, we thank you for your revelation. Yeah. Holy Spirit, we're asking that you talk straight to us. Yeah. And we see a world that is oppressed and in captivity and stuck in cycles that they can't get out of. And Father, you give us an insight and revelation in how to help and how to deal and how to minister freedom. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this is where I want to start. I'd I'd probably start with this simple question. Have you ever asked, have you ever done something that you just thought like, well, that's just not me? You know, you ever... You ever been in an arena where you're like, no, I'm not that kind of a person. You know, like, that's not me. I'm not that kind of a guy. I'm not kind of, you know. Um, for me, it's the thing like dancing. You know, it's, it's just not my thing. Um, I mean, I want it to be my thing, just confession, because I'm a drummer. You think it would translate. You know, I got rhythm in there somewhere, but then I start dancing, and then my wife's like, you know, like, you just can't unsee it, right? I don't really know. And the hard thing about dancing is, like, honestly, it's so bad. Like, when people, like, people stop and stare for all the bad reasons. It's ugly when I start to dance. Um, but I don't really know what to do when I start to dance. Like, you have the, the moves, right? You, you go to these things in, uh, like, weddings where all the happy people get together and celebrate. Bethany just had a wedding. She works her head off. That was awesome. I went there, and then the dance part happened. And I thought, no, that's not my thing. I just sat back and watched everyone else be happy and dance. And this is how it went down. I started to dance for a second. And within 30 seconds, people gathered around with cameras. Like, <laughs> come on. So I don't, I, I don't know what to do. Do you just like bob? Do you make the angry face? Do you like do the bum dance? I, I don't know how. Go, make, it's just forget it. It's just not my thing. I'm not a dancer. I'm not. No, no, no. And here's the thing. You know, for, for me as dancing, for other pastors, I, I'd say a lot of the area that we would say is just not our thing. I just not really. I'll just leave it for those people because they're the kind of people that they know what to do um, and they know how to do it well is, is pastors will think of addictions and abuse like that. We're like, it's just not my thing. Uh, oftentimes, it's like, you know what, we'll leave it to the professionals, because, and we, so, so oftentimes, we disqualify ourselves, like, I'm not really qualified to deal with that, I don't really know what to say or to do, do I just bob or angry face or bump dance, or do I, do I talk to them about Jesus, do I send them to professional, do I report this to the police, how do I do it, what do I do, how do I even start with this thing, and we, whether we disqualify ourselves through, well, I don't have a history, like tech and meth and fentanyl, is that, is that like Tylenol, like, I don't really know, never really tried this stuff, never smoked a joint, you know, like my mom caught me having a sip of wine once and I got grounded for six months when I was 13 and never touched the stuff since. Like, it might be your thing. You just don't know what to do and how to, how to do, but whatever it is, you can't disqualify yourself because Jesus in Luke 4 starts his ministry quoting Isaiah 61 and he goes on to say it this way. He says, this is what I've been anointed to do. The God of the universe incarnate in Christ Jesus, the, you see the father, you see Jesus, Jesus the Father, this is a reflection of who God is. He says, I'm a, this is what I'm about. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Everyone say anointed. Anointed. To proclaim the good news to the poor. How do you change a city? You go to the poor. To proclaim the good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and liberty to those oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus stands up 
before he start, as he's starting his ministry, opens the scroll and says, I'm that guy, rolls up the scroll and drops the mic and says, I'm the guy that's going to take the foot off the throat of oppression. I, I'm the guy that's going to bust the prison doors open. I am the one anointed to free people. There's no longer your slave to fear or all these issues of the heart and the soul. I came to bring life and abundantly. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And here's the newsflash. He's inside of you. And that means you're anointed to do it. And I think the biggest thing I want you to walk away from is, well, it's just not for me. No, it's, I'm not that guy. Well, it's someone else that knows what they're doing and knows how to dance and knows the actions and the steps and the things and the, you're anointed for it. You're anointed for it. You've been equipped for it. It's one of those things where we're learning as we go. So I don't really know um, as much as I'd like. Um, But the more we do it is I remember um, the first time someone overdosed on her back alley and I run and grab a knock on kit and catch them like a minute before they're dead. And as they like start to stop breathing, we're like, God, just bring them back to life. Like, I don't know what to do with that, God. You know, I don't know what to do with that. Like, or, or you think it's not in the church, and then someone you know, with two kids and a wife um, that could have been a deacon steps up and says, I'm addicted. Right? I, we got to do something about that. Or it's a single mom that had a party at her house because she just wanted to have a good time and then overdosed and then lost her kids and the whole place is... Yeah. And it was an accident. It was just a bad batch. It's real stuff. Or whether it's the abuse cycles, right? You know, for us, we, you know, it's even just this last week, we deal with violence. And, you know, someone's out front of the church with a machete two weeks ago. People come with guns often enough. It's, it's real stories. I know you don't deal, like, there's, we're in a different context. But I want to talk to you, like, about your context. Um, and I think what I think pastors should probably know, um, at least have a little bit of a, a start the conversation. Yeah. Because the truth of it, guys, is I remember, this is an awakening moment for me, is I remember um, coming up to the church. We had a church event, and this young, looked like she was 17, came up to me and propositioned me. Um, I'm, like, I'm like, no, 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 I'm not that. No, no, you should come to church. I'm the pastor. You, you should come. You coming? Okay. And I turned my back, and some Arab dude swept her away, and she was being trafficked off the front lawn. And they just being picked up, picked up again, again, and again. I watched prostitutes being picked up, and I'm like, oh, like we have to do something about this. Like, that's not okay. Yeah. That's, it's not okay. And, and, and it's one of those things that you might think these issues, they're blatant for us. But when I talk to the police about overdose and abuse, the stats aren't, aren't, aren't demographically located. It's not like, well, it's the northwest and not the southeast or the north. The cops are like, it's, it's rampant. Yeah, like the thing is someone overdoses downtown, someone's going to find them because they're on the corner. Someone overdoses in their basement, and what do you do? Like, here's a, they're dead. And it's these issues. It's our society is becoming more and more addicted because they don't know what to do with their own soul. Our, our society is becoming more and more entrenched in captivity. And our, we, as pastors, have to be um, equipped and at least start the process of getting to know what to do um, because it's running rampant. Yeah. Um, and so today was a little bit of a crash course, but a little bit of a heart to start a conversation. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to have a little bit of a, a couple case studies, five minutes at a time. How did Jesus um, approach people stuck, stuck, whether it's in abuse or captivity or oppression? Um, so point one on your, on your sheet, get ready. I'm going to pass it to my wife. Okay. So yeah, we don't have a lot of time, and it is a privilege to talk about it. I just want full disclosure. Um, when we started ministry, we did not think that we would be in the place that we, the Lord has brought us. Um, Nathan and I have always said, when we began ministry, the Lord told us, um, he told us, he told us, you will do it together. So we always knew that, and that's what we've been committed to. And we've always said, we will be, and this is... <laughs> This is our life statement. I love what Pastor Will said about Holy Spirit, you lead, will follow. Ours is uh, we are two fools living in radical obedience to Jesus. And whatever he says, my commitment before him has been, Lord, I give you my yes. And a lot of times it has been uh, yes through my husband, my husband asking me things. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can empathize with you, Pastor Ning, about not, you know, like, no. But uh, I've been committed to say before the Lord, yes, I give you my yes. And so often it's my husband saying, okay, do the, oh, he's got a timer on. He knows me. Okay, so, <laughs> so 
So if you want to, so you are anointed as representatives of Jesus to know this. You are anointed and you are appointed. This is an assignment on our lives to, to heal and to preach the good news to the poor, uh, those that are caught up. So an important thing, if you want to help someone, because there's like a myriad of, of uh, practical things. We don't really have enough time. So from the heart of a shepherd to the heart of a shepherd, if your heart is to help, you need to first recognize there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of shame and guilt that these, that these people who are struggling with cycles of destructive behavior are sitting under. And before we can even have opportunity to minister the truth of, of the word of God, there, we need to recognize that that is our first obstacle, the shame And we need to know that shame is the language of the demonic realm. It really is. Shame will come and it brings accusation. We know that that's who Satan is. He's the accuser. That's his name in Revelation. And he comes and it will sound different to every person. It will sound like you're a failure. You will never, ever change. You will always be like this. And so we need to recognize that that shame, it's a spiritual battle and, 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 Conviction is different than shame. I mean, conviction, conviction leads people to Jesus. Shame, look back at the Garden of Eden. Shame repels people. People want to hide and people will hide. And I can guarantee you, there may be some, well, I can't guarantee you, but I think very likely if you haven't seen someone in your church for weeks, uh, they might just be staying away because they are sitting under shame and they don't want you to know what they did. And, and shame is, it, it can destroy you, but the Holy Spirit brings conviction. It's his job to bring conviction. We must be faithful to preach the truth and then we don't bring conviction. That's not our job. It's the Holy Spirit's job, John 16 says. So we need to speak the truth in love and allow the Holy Spirit to do his job and recognize that shame has no place. Shame cannot have a place within the body of Christ. We cannot help someone at an arm's length. And so we first have to draw people close. And so uh, I love what you said, uh, Bishop uh, Rich, when you said sinners were comfortable around Jesus. That hit me like a weight of bricks. Because sometimes we can be, as, uh, as shepherds, we can be unapproachable, we can be intimidating. We need to recognize, like, even when I think about the story in, in Scripture, in, um, was, I think it's John chapter 8 I have here, where there is a woman caught in adultery. And it is the people of God that are standing before her, armed and dangerous. In one hand, they have a stone to kill her, and in the other hand, they have the Word of God. And they go up to Jesus, and the word says their motive was to trap Jesus. That was their motive. They had no motive of love there. Their motive was death and and to be clever and to be like, it was really pride and arrogance, which is religion. And, And whenever we want to use the word of God as a weapon against people, because it is a weapon, it is meant to be a weapon, it's a sword but it is a weapon against our adversary, the devil, like what was just said. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It is against principalities. And whenever we weld the word of God as a weapon, we are no longer operating as representatives of Jesus. So we need to recognize we got to come against the shame. We got to speak the truth in love. And just as Jesus said to this woman, he stands on her defense. He did not excuse her sin, but he defended her humanity. And then he said, where are your accusers now? And he said, now go and sin no more. But you see how he got close enough to see her first. The shame was gone. Jesus stands in in opposition to accusation. So for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some notes because I know uh, Nate has a ton to say. So (laughs) So, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say this last thing because I really believe four words have tremendous power and somebody's salvation is on the other side of it. And those four words are come as you are. 
come as you are. Like, honestly, people will stay away from church because they feel, there was a guy that lives in the manor, actually, he's a funny guy, he's so funny, and he would not come to church. He would never come to church. And one day we were sitting in the sanctuary and he walks through church and he's holding a fire hydrant. And he's just like walking like this, trying to be funny. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I don't want God to smite me. He knows what I've done. And you know, even though that was just a joke, we invited this man again and again and he would not come to church. There was a lot of shame. Praise God, he comes, he's tended, he's given his life to the Lord since. But it come as you are. We are called to be fishers of men. Let the Holy Spirit clean them. He'll gut them. We got to bring them in. Okay? Amen. Come as you are. That's good. Oh, I, I, I never got to my pee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we need to have, but to go close to people, you need to have, like Jesus had, a posture of humility. A posture of humility. I love that, what, uh, what, what Dr. J was saying, how... The Apostle Paul grew in humility. Oh, he grew in humility. But he, I think it's incredible. I believe he was so effective as an apostle because he truly believed he was the worst of all sinners. So he didn't come. He wasn't like, I'm this guy up here. I'm going to go help everyone. He's like, you know what? I'm a sinner too. And when you really have that perspective, at the, cross, at the foot of the cross, we are equal. That is a message of truth, and it is a message that draws people near. You know what? Your problem looks different than my problem, but I am just as in need of Jesus as you are. He, a posture of humility. So good. So I, I, think, I think Rick Warren said it. He said, hey, love doesn't look down, it stoops down. So he got down, and he wrote in the dirt, and he sees the woman, fights for the humanity, not fights against the person. Um, you know, is that, is that moment of, like, I see you. Um, you know the woman, the woman at the well, the theological conversation. Well, what, what, where's the temple? What's the, who, who's got the right land and who's right? And Samaritans versus Jerusalem, you know, the Israelites, and is this? And they had this big theological conversation. Here's this woman who's caught up in shame and caught up in a, a broken place, and she's trying to posture herself like she knows what she's doing, and maybe she's got it all together. And and Jesus turns to her and says, Hey, 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 I see you. I know everything about you. I know who you are, and I'm still here. Yeah, yeah you've had five husbands. Yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, you're a Samaritan, and I'm a Jew. I'm still here. Yeah. And it's that moment of, of seeing people is, is this relationship. So under that first point, if you got under posture, just put a little relationship. You build this relationship. You, you see the person. And after that, point number two would say point to Jesus. And it might feel a little cliche and a little bit simple, but honestly, for the, what do I do? This is it. This is where you start. You always point to Jesus. Here's this woman that has this encounter with Jesus. I, and he, she had this testimony running through the streets and starting a revival, you know, in Samaria because there's, a, there's the God of the universe that knows me. He sees me and he loves me. And here's the plight of every person's heart is to be loved, loved and known. And often those two don't go together. We're loved. I love you, brother, until I got to know you and I found you're crazy. No, I don't really understand. I love you until you found out you got issues. We all got them. And we, those things don't go together or you're known and you're not loved. Or they're loved, but I'm not known. And when those two things go and he knows me and he loves me and he's still here, it lights this woman up. Like it, it says, you're not alone anymore. You're not invisible anymore like I see you and it's this moment where you begin to see and it's you point to Jesus because God sees you he knows exactly who you are and this woman encounters Jesus grace the word you know, word for grace is charis the power to change he encountered power and you got to always point to Jesus and here's the greatest temptation you'll have we'll give it to the professionals we got, you got a lot of agencies out there that are doing a lot of good things, and they're great. We'll just leave it to them. That You can work with them. Don't leave it to them. Um, here's the thing. They don't got Jesus, and they can't even get out of single-digit percentages and su success rates. You know, like they just, they, they just isn't working. Even AA, the good version of it, when it was started by Christians, would say, you know, you have to acknowledge a higher power. You know, and then they get, got all secular and say, well, the higher power can be a ducky, rubber ducky or a chair or something. You just got to surrender to something else. Bull shenanigans, yeah, that happened. Um, 
Uh, you know, come on, there's no power in a rubber ducky. You know, I can take a vacuum and I can plug it into the rubber ducky, plug it in the chair, plug it in my, that vacuum is not going to run until I plug it into power. So when you meet Jesus, there's actually cares, actually power to change. And this is that moment, even cooler than that, it, it, it begins to redefine you. You know, AA would say, hey, my name is Nathan and I'm an alcoholic. My name is Nathan and I'm my greatest failure. This is who I am. I'm stuck that way. I'm always under it. Come on. Yeah. Like you, I, now my name is Nathan. I'm a child of God. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the head, not the tail, the victor, not the victim. Yeah. The, I'm a conqueror. This is, I got a new identity yeah. when you meet just good luck finding that anywhere else. Yeah. They have to meet Jesus. Yeah. And I have this conversation all the time. Hey, so you're not religious. Hey, you don't really want to meet Jesus. Is it working for you? And like, yeah. just give him a try. Taste and see. Yeah. Start a relationship. Yeah. This world is fractured because it pushed them out. And just invite them in. Just try. Dare you. Give it 21 days to make and break a habit. Start a habit with Jesus and see what he does in your life. And it's one of these things that it's just beautiful to see. You got to point to Jesus because it's this transformative power in intimacy with God. Look at Acts 4. These wimps hiding out in an upper room trying not to be killed turned into maniacs that were changing the planet because they said that they got to know Jesus. They've been with him. You could tell that they've been with him. Um, it's this transformation in this. So you, second point, point to Jesus, always. Never, never, ever just give it over to not Jesus. Um, and there's a lot of structures we can work with, and I want to talk to you after that. Your job as a pastor is always to point them to Jesus. Get them going to where the power really is. Um, and then now your job is for the third P is the process. Grab them by the hand and walk them through a process. And it's this moment in John 5 where um, th there's the, the lame man on a mat at the pool. And he's waiting for the water to ripple because legend was that, you know, angels pass by. And if you get in the water first, then it's all good because then you can be healed if you got in first. And Jesus comes up to a man and says, hey, do you want to be healed? He's been sitting there for years. And here's the fun thing is you find a lot of abuse and addiction. There, there's, it said there's a multitude of people just waiting. They're waiting and they're wanting to change. Mm -hmm. But they're waiting for something to change out there. Yeah. Waiting for some circumstance to change. Yeah. Waiting for someone to get their poop in a group and a relationship to change or something externally to fix the internal. Like, if something out there changes, then I can change in here. And it's this moment of Jesus goes, do you even want to change? Yeah. Like, Jesus just got, got fired from the altar call ministry. Just, yeah. if he was part of most people's churches, like, do you even want to change? Do you even want healing? Do you even want this? You're fired. You shouldn't talk to people that way. You're like, but Jesus goes, here's the, are you done being the victim? Yes. He doesn't sit back and be like, well, let's just rehash what landed you here and coddle you until it's all. Are you wanting to actually change? And we have this perception that Jesus would just sit down and pet their little head and stroke. I'm telling you, there's a time to deal with the roots to the fruits. There's a time to deal with the emotional things. There's always something driving it. But I'm telling you, at this time, his message to this lame man is you stand up. You stand up and you walk. Not me do it for you. It was this moment of like, are you, but I think the biggest question is, do you want to change? And you can throw that scripture up there. It says, after that, it's, look at, check it out. You look at his excuses. He goes, do you want to change? And he doesn't even say yes. Like, he goes, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, I, I can't, can you throw it out there? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going to another steps down before me. He's going, hey, 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 but I got nobody. You know, I'm, and, it's, and he begins to have the excuses. And here's the thing about excuses. You have to get them past it. In that moment, you, you begin to stagnate in your growth as minute, the minute you make an excuse. You, you don't want to grow? Just make excuses. Don't want to ever progress? Just make an excuse. And they can be really good excuses, but you got to get them out of the excuses because going, hey, 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 I, I don't have, and it, it begins to play this blame game. And you'll see it all the time with especially addicts. There's a blame game. Well, it's their fault and they did it. My mom never loved me and they hurt me and this. And, and they can be really good excuses. But Jesus wasn't like, hey, let's talk about who, who failed you. He didn't, he didn't actually even say that here. As a, and he's the ultimate pastor, right? Here's a case study of who, how he handles it. Um, well, I, he's just, are you done being the victim? Because here's the thing about victim mentalities is they will ask you to do it for them and then blame you for not doing it. 
because it's your problem and you hurt me again and someone else hurt me and the life is against me and it's not fair and it's you stand up and I'm going to be your friend and walk with you. You stand up. And it's, and it's one of those moments you even see a good excuse. Hey, but I had no one to take me. I got no one. And here's, it's a good, who said excuses are bad? Some are really good. I don't have anybody. Here's the, one of the biggest drivers of, a, of what sustains captivity is that I have no one. Jesus is like, you don't have no one now. I'm here. Your job as a pastor is to make sure that they don't have no one. And it's, we call it in the social services sector, like you, just, you build a web or support network. If you spider builds a web and there's only one strand, the minute that strand, only one relationship, the minute that relationship or that strand goes bad, they're in the wind. But you begin to connect them into all these different places and support systems and you begin to build a web so that it's not all on you as a pastor. And, and you begin to, but you're not alone. And you, you have, have these excuses that just pour in. You build this web you, um, and you bypass the excuses. And I, and I think so oftentimes they just were like, but, I, but life isn't fair. Let's just be straight. You don't understand who, had, who did this to me and who wronged me. And I, I, I think you have the wrong conversation if you're having this conversation. The right conversation is let's talk about what Jesus did first. This is who, who, who he is, what he did for you. Um, and when you begin that conversation, you flip it on its head, it's because it's your choice. You can stay here yeah. or you can be more than a conqueror, right? You begin to flip the conversation. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing because this is, this is the heart is in this process, your job, your key role. If you want to walk away, like, what do I do as a pastor? Your key role is you got to build a process where your job is to walk with, you never walk for. You walk with, you never walk for. You can carry, you can care, but you don't carry, you know? Like, it's one of those things. Walk with, not for. Care, not carry. Um, you stand up. You walk. Are you done being the victim? Um, and here's where I really want to stand is when you do this, you stand up. Okay, stand up and walk. And there's this moment of like, I'm ready. I believe. And you have this moment of belief. This person probably believed again and again and again and took hit after hit and disappointment after disappointment until finally, like, I'm just done. I just don't believe. Do you believe? And you get someone willing to believe enough. Your job is to stoke their faith. Speak vision. Get them seeing who Jesus is and who they are in Christ. Yep. Build them as a spiritual being. Get them to stand up and then what this is where the process comes in you walk with them in a process and so I'm going to walk through this real quick uh, the addiction action plan for us looks something like this so you make a plan with them step one for addictions you make a plan with them they're not ba- you're not babysit them they make the plan and you walk with them so what do we need to do next and so with addictions typically you need to figure out what your dry out plan is you know if they're is there a heavy alcoholic? Did you know that's a blood thinner? Did you know that you're probably, you know, there's risks of heart, heart attacks and blood clots? Like, if it's an alcohol thing, they probably need, and it's heavy, they need a medical place. You know, if it's meth, you got one week after coming off of meth, which is like a high suicide rate, yeah. um, you got to get them some medical dry out. And so for us, it's Renfrew. Was it for you? Um, some of you guys, it might not be a medical dry out, but what are you doing? Get them out of the city. Get them into a, a place to dry out. If it's a friend, if it's a small group, if it's an elder, just get them to dry out somewhere for at least a week. Um, and then after that, what are you doing for treatment? And for us, we have a dry out plan for about a week. Um, after that, we have about a, a one to three month treatment, depending on where we can put you. Um, and this is, you know, where, you, where do you send people is a big question that you probably need to figure out as a church. Um, because this is where you work with. But the hard thing about this is you, you send them to a dry out and they kick them to the curb. Good luck. You're the person that picks them up or someone in a small group or that community, that web, catches them and that brings them to treatment. And after treatment, you just go live back with the old people that, you know, just go live with a bunch of crack actors again and try not to do crack. Actually, we're going to catch you at the bottom of that and we're going to figure out something else. And here's what, what do you do for dry out? What do you do? What do you do for treatment? Um, and I'd say that the other one is your landing spot. Who's the mentor? Who's the community? What's their purpose? Get them serving in your church because a lot of addiction yeah. is driven by just, I just don't yeah. know what I'm called for. Get them on purpose. Yeah. Get them in a community. Um, and then you start dealing with the roots. So 
That's the action plan for addiction. Um, abuse plan is a little bit oh, simpler because uh, this is a little bit deeper. Um, and a lot of addiction actually comes from an abuse plan. But in this, it's all about building relationship. And it has one word, trust. Just trust. They have to trust you. There's, I, have, I have a lady that would not come out of captivity. She is being trafficked every day from a cage. And she landed on our church doorstep. And she did not say we could help her because she trusts her captors more than she trusts me. Oh, come on. They got to trust you. They got to trust the situation. They got to trust that you have them. And once you, with the abuse action plan, once they trust you, you use that trust and you pull as hard as you can and you make the jump plan. What does it look like to jump? Um, and so oftentimes it's, you know, it's that you get them into a safer place, a woman's shelter or something. We've had women like run into our building, slam the door and say, get them away from me. Like, so you have to like scoop them out of the city and get them someplace safe. Right? Uh, what do you do? Um, and so this is that process. Begin to think through uh, what it is that you would do. And so you have the relationship. You have the jump plan. But I'd say, especially when it comes to little kids, um, here's what you got to do is you got to share the liability. Um, and so it's not all, all on you. What do I do? Do I call the police? If it's kids, you always, yeah, you always go there. Um, but typically, you share the liability. You first go to the parents. And when you're dealing with abuse, always go to parents. When it's kids, always go to um, social agencies. You begin to build a web of connections around them. And the fun thing is you are liable in these situations. But when you share the liability, it's on the whole community now. Um, and so your job is when you take those connections, they trust you enough, you begin to build that web around them. Um, and I think we got to wrap this up. Um, and so there's a, two quick action plans. And I'd say more than anything is... What is your process? And you got a quick minute? Yeah, I don't know how long. Do we need to wrap up? Yeah, we're finished. We're done. We're cool. Yeah. She was going to talk about the believing, the power of potential and just believing in people. Okay. Um, I do have a question for you guys. Yeah, what's the question? Um, you know, what you've shared is so valuable. What they've shared is so incredibly valuable. I personally believe that we're going to see a lot more addicted people in these last days. And I think all of us, uh, really need to understand this. Uh, obviously, they just had, you know, 30, 40 minutes here to share. Um, but I have a question for you guys. Um, do you have uh, a program within your church or within the organization, uh, Victory Outreach, where if a person is serious about wanting to learn mm -hmm. about how to deal with addict addiction, uh, could they come? and spend a week or two weeks uh, with you guys and learn on the job? You could come and hang out with us at this point. I wouldn't say it's a program. And can I just, a sobering fact, um, it says one in every four women are, are physically abused or sexually abused. It's actually closer to one in three. And in our demographic, it's almost 100%. Um, this is a reality. Um, addiction is real. We, we as a church have to have a process in place. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. so, Pastor Nathan, I think that we should find some way mm -hmm. of opening this up for people who are serious about learning yeah. mm -hmm. to just come and spend a couple and hang out with you guys. I've hung out down there mm -hmm. and I've mixed with the working girls on the street. One thing that the working girls say, uh, the prostitutes outside the church that are actually walking the strip there, they say, we hang out here because we feel safer outside a church that might seem really weird to you but you know what really touched my heart because they're sensing the lord amen so i would like to throw that out there if there's anyone in your church who really wants to learn then these guys are the ones to hang out with amen so praise the lord thank you very much uh, aren't they a great husband and wife husband and wife ministry team